Welcome to the House of Truth. Last week we talked about the we talked about the arrival of the Lamb, and all these details concerning the concerning well lambs in general played into the birth of Messiah. You know, including the fact he was born at the time lambs were born in the northern hemisphere during the spring, and it was very demonstrable from three from three different ways that we looked at. Not just one three different testimonies about this in the, in the word of God. And, you know, most importantly was we looked at, we, we looked at the conflict between the script, the, between the genealogy of Joseph in the gospel of Matthew, where, 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 where there's third, where, where, where he, where, where Joseph would be number 13 or number 12 after the Babylonian exile uh, uh, and in the one in Luke, where he's number twenty-one after the exile, and we showed how how this shows what what every historian from from about one hundred A.D. to three to four hundred A.D. said that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew and translated to Greek by people who didn't speak native Hebrew. They did the best they could, you know. And, and there was some uh, 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 so what we end up with our English translation, a translation of a translation. The mistake was made. Because if you if if you go with what the with the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew says, like in um, Breslau number nine, there, there were ten there were ten versions of this found in in Breslau, which is all, now the Germans call it Breslau, the Poles called it the Poles call it Rokla, and one in Saint Petersburg, Breslau number nine in Saint Petersburg, were jot and tittle the same. A lot of the others were obviously tra back translation from Hebrew from Latin or whatever, but this. But these two show they came from a common document, and they say Mary, Joseph, the father of Mary, which makes which gives you your fourteen generations, says in Matthew, and resolves all these other issues. And you can go back and listen to that, and I, I, I show more detail about that. But today we're today we're going to talk about we're going to talk about Saint Patrick. Now, when I say saint, I don't mean any, any Roman Catholic way. Or, or or um or Greek Orthodox way or something where you know someone that's venerated where to worship and that I mean it in the biblical way where we're all called referred to as saints. The Hebrew words Zedekim, the righteous ones. You know, uh, Agiosis in, in, in Greek, the, the holy ones, okay. But but the word is saints, okay, in in, in English and and that's what I mean. I just said to distinguish him from the non-believers. So if I say, you know, if I say St. Patrick, that's what I, that's what I mean. I don't mean, again, any kind of manner of worshiping him or anything whatsoever. And, you know, St. Pa Patrick, St. Patrick, St. Patrick without a doubt is like the foundational person uh, uh, brought, who brought, the belief in Messiah to Ireland, without a doubt, he was not first. The first we know of was about two was, was about around two hundred A.D. You know, more almost two hundred years before Saint Patrick was born. You know, was born. In fact, one of the Irish king, the Irish high king Cormac, became a became a, became a believer in two sixty six A.D. Again, this is this this that and that was that's about one hundred and. That's over 130 years before St. Patrick was ever born. So he wasn't first to bring to bring to bring this knowledge at all to Ireland, but it just didn't catch on. What the these other people they weren't apostles in the biblical sense of go somewhere with go somewhere and create congregations and you know and so on and so forth. They 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 weren't church planters. They, they they were they were Roman merchants who went over there for, you know, and maybe had a little a little congregation right where they sat mostly of other British Romano people who who immigrate who came over with them, and they didn't really go out to the Irish, and bring the gospel, the way the way Patrick did. Of course, you know one guy did because got with the king, but that was it. it was just, but the, as I mentioned before, the you know the king there, but so Patrick's the one who really. Was the was the apostle to the Irish, without a doubt. However, there's a lot there, there's there's a lot there's a lot of issues with this, and, and one of the issue 
it, because the problem the problem arises from most people don't really know who he was at all and don't don't have any real clue and the reason is because like myself i didn't i did not like this guy i didn't like st patrick's day growing up i had irish classmates and they were superstitious and you know and basically you know it was a day with a lot of fights for me they pinched i punched you know it was a it was not a good you know it was not a good time for me and i didn't and i, I just thought this was like christmas and whatever else and so I'm out to, I'm out. I said, I'm going to go and find out the, dig up the dirt on St. Patrick. Well, what I found in digging the dirt was the dirt wasn't on St. Patrick. It was, on, it was, on, it was on the, it was on the promoters of St. Patrick. Because what they had done is they had wrote a false history of him. The history, if, if you ever watched like the VeggieTales thing about St. Patrick or heard the common thing, the, the common story of him, you know, and, and he's pictured often in cathedrals with a, you know, Super white, by the way. I, I don't mean like, I, I mean like we're talking about toilet paper tissue. We're talking about tissue toilet paper white, okay? Not you know, not not any kind of light light shade of brown. You know, extremely light shade of brown. We're talking about again tissue paper white, okay? Um, he has a crozer, this shepherd staff thing with a pointy end on the end where he, he's supposed to have stabbed one of the kings in his foot to baptize him, and you know, and, and, and there's all these stories about. You know him bringing rocks out of the sea and crushing kings, and you know, you know, and, and all these things, and it are written, and, and they mostly came from this from, the, from these two guys. So these two guys were sent by the, the 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 Pope had sent people the as soon as the Roman universal religion, Catholic means universal, became established. Be, be, first of all, Constantine didn't create it; he he legalized Christianity. He quit out. He got rid of being an outlawed. It was now a loud religion. Before that, there was only two: Judaism and the Roman and the Greco-Roman paganism. In fact, they destroyed they destroyed the religion of the Druids completely out of the Roman Empire, except the interior of Scotland. They never really quite got to quite total control of Scotland, but they did. They did manage to get go around the entire island, take all the borders. But they never got. They never really took control of the Highlands, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And, and the Druids hung out there, but they were also over in nearby Ireland and could come in and come back in later, which they did as well. So, he, so he never, so, but they, the emperor wanted a unified religion, a later emperor. And so he commissioned them and they, and they make, they make this, they, they make this, they make this religion that basically they, 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 they take biblical Christianity and they, the things of the Bible, they marry them with things of the paganism. They kind of make this um, syncretic, syncretic religion, you know, kind of this unnatural, unnatural hybrid. Okay, and so that they send people over, even during the times they, they're over there to try to bring it. And the British, and 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 the, and the British who were there, who had pre, the British there were at Celtic Christianity. As I discussed before, came over by a guy named Illid in 54 AD, a disciple of St. Paul, and I showed how his teachings line up with the Bible, the previous lesson, brought this, and this is what was practiced there, and the people there were totally opposed to this Roman Greco religion, mean, this, this Roman universal religion. In fact, it led to so much confrontation, it took the Roman, Roman, Romans had 24 legions, they had to keep three in Britain all the time. Just to try to keep, just to try to force people, just try to enforce this new religion, and and later, because it was constant resistance to it, and eventually, uh, attacking armies, attacking armies in, in the Roman Empire forced them to bring two of the, two 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 of those um, legions out. Only one legion left that could not maintain control, and the and the emperor side so needed it too, and and to honorius and brought it out, and the, effectively. The Romans were driven out of Britain, first place they lost, over, over trying to bring in the, the, the Roman universal, bring it under the Roman universal religion. And what Celtic Christianity, its original form, which we'll discuss in a moment here, prevailed. But they, but they weren't done. They, 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 they made more efforts, and we'll talk about those later. But Patrick, but, but this guy, Probus and, Probus and Jocelyn 
were sent to write a history of, of Patrick, make one up, really, to make him look Catholic and make and convince the Irish people that follow that 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 that, that, that Patrick taught Roman Catholicism. Well, again, this was they, they were not trying to write history, go find out the facts and write down what happened. They were there for a very specific mission, which they were pretty, which they were successful at in Southern Ireland to a great extent, of convincing people that hey, Patrick, Patrick, Patrick practiced Catholicism. You need to do it too. And in their efforts, the false church of Rome actually sent people to to attack to attack the libraries where Patrick's works writings were kept and and these kind of things, and managed to wipe out quite a few of them. But one, well, one of the one of the not his direct disciple, but one of the disciples of this Celtic Christianity managed to save, managed to pull his his confessio, his his his, his uh, diary, Patrick's diary, out of out of the fire and save eighty seven paragraphs of it, which you can get to this day and read, and also some letters like a letter, like like his letter, like his letter to King King Corticus survived as well. Okay. And also the right and more than that, the writings of his enemies, Patrick's enemies, also survived. And, and even records of the Catholic Church itself that agree that that, 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 that that agree with this that were written much earlier were there as well. When you look at these other sources, you get an entirely different picture of St. Patrick than the official the official one given by Probus and Probus and Jocelyn written in 1100 AD, about 600 years, at, I mean, five, almost 600 years after Patrick had died. Be kind of like me writing a, writing a history, Simon write a history about Columbus discovering America and saying, well, by the way, there's a fourth ship and it flew. Okay. The, you know, there's... So, what was Patrick like? Well, Patrick... So what did Patrick teach? Well, it's best summed up in, 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 the, in the letter of Augustine. This is not Augustine of Hippo. This is an Augustine who started, who went to Canterbury in 597 AD and started and, and, and started the first Catholic church in what's today England, in Canterbury, which later became the Church of England. And indeed, its headquarters is still there, St. Paul Cathedral, except, well, I think, think, think Paul Cathedral thinks actually over in a, over in London, but anyways, so you know, Canterbury there, and Canterbury. I'm sorry, and, and the and and, he, and here's what and he was sent over there by the Pope in in 597, 100 years after Patrick dies, and with this mission, find out what they find out what they believe, try to talk to them, see if we can find common ground and bring them into the Catholic fold. And here's what Augustine's report back said. I think we're going to, I'm summarizing it here. I think we're going to have a tough time doing this. Because one, they don't meet on Sunday. They meet on the Sabbath. Two, they don't observe our holidays. They observe the holidays of the Bible. You know, particularly ones in Leviticus 23. Three, they only eat food that got the only food that the, the same food as the Jews that the Bible calls clean. Four, Patrick warned them to have nothing to do with us. This is the real St. Patrick, okay? He wasn't just not Catholic, he was opposed to the Catholic Church completely. So, same, and he was a and, he, and they opposed him as well. We'll talk about that as we go along. They caused him trouble throughout. They caused him trouble through a lot of his life. So, Saint Patrick needed a lot of wisdom to deal with all this. And you know what was his inspiration? How, he got in situations. How? I mean, what gave him confidence? To do this, to take this course of action that God would, and that God would work, it would work out His favor, and God would show up. Well, it it was it was it was what it was what he had heard when he was young. His father was a Roman was was a Roman officer. Was a Roman officer before the before the 
where the Romans got kicked out. And even when they left, they said they was going to come back. And it took a, about for about 30 years, people the British thought the Romans were going to come back and, and, and so on. So his father was stationed in what, what was called, right, right at the border of what's called the Old North, roughly the area where well of North Wells in Southeast Scotland meet today, in that area roughly. He was head of a garrison. And he was also, his father had been a pastor, a pastor of Celtic Christianity in this community at the, at the garrison. Now he, now he was. This is Patrick's father. And Patrick had heard, had, had, had heard the Bible, but he, he pretty much had no interest when he was sick until, until later. When he was 16, he, and, and, and oh wait, we'll go back to that. His father's name, his father's main job was to protect it from, protect from pirates who were raiding, who were raiding what's uh, the western edge there of British, of British, Ro, of, of Roman Britain from the Dalcassians of Southern Ireland and the Scotty who came from Northern Ireland and, and also Northeast Scot Scotland today, what we call it, the Scotty. They were, they were pirates in would raid. And that's what his garrison was supposed to be protecting them people from. And he continued doing this even after the Romans pulled out. Well, Patrick, ironically, when he was 16, when he was 16, he was down by, he was down, he was down by, he went down to the beach, had no interest in the things that his father taught at all. And he got captured by pirates and took off and enslaved in Northern Ireland. And he lived, and while there, he was, he, he, he was a shepherd. He, he was put to work as a shepherd, not pigs. They weren't even introduced. Ireland, like, like snakes, Ireland had no, had no pigs till they were introduced later, although Britain did. Oddly enough, Britain had snakes and pigs. Ireland didn't. So he, he, they weren't introduced yet. He was a shepherd, as he writes in his own journal. And he was there for seven years, six, seven years. And then while there, he, 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 he had no one else. I mean, he was out by himself. He wasn't even like Heather Shepherds. He, 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 he started about God. And he came to God. And he, started, I mean, he, came, he came to faith. He started praying a hundred times a day, you know, according, according to what he said, he, you know, they have a lot else to do. And really they started developing this really close relationship with God. And he got baptized in the Holy Spirit at one point, because according to his own writings, he spoke in tongues. Well, later, one day the Holy Spirit tells him, it's time for you to go home and just have, and have it says, go to the coast and you'll meet someone there. And they're going to take you and they'll take you back to your home. So he walks this, he just left the sheep and walked a hundred miles to the coast. While there, while there he, he meets a druid, he, he meets a, he, he meets a druid who becomes his first, first the guy, the guys are suspicious of him, but he converts them and they take him back to his home as indeed. Well, he's, he's at home for about five more years. Now he's under his father and he's learning and his father's reinforcing him to these lessons Particular, there's three men that particularly are of interest to Patrick, who are, who are where he's going to get all this wisdom from: Moses, David, and Paul. Shoal, the Apostle Paul. So, Moses, the lawgiver; David, the King of Israel; Shoal, the Apostle to the Gentiles. And his life parallels that, and that's where he gets a lot of his wisdom, which we're going to look at today. Uh, in 408, in 408, around four, about 400 AD, when Patrick's when Patrick's a, when Patrick's around uh, twenty seven years old, by this point, he has a Patrick has a dream, and one of the Irishmen, and we'll talk about that dream later. But he gets called back to Ireland, and he goes on again to be the apostle of the, uh, the apostle of the Irish, and we'll just we'll just talk about him as we go through these scriptures. But remember, he's getting his he's getting his wisdom out of all these situations. Primarily from look at the lives of Moses, King David, and the Apostle Paul. As you'll see, they face similar situations to each other and him and, he, and how they handle them. And that's not exactly the model Patrick used to get his wisdom. Now we're going to begin with our foundation of what each one of these men did. And in Genesis 24, verse, in 24, verse 12, we read the following. The, the Lord said... No. The Lord said to Moses, come to me into the mount and be there. And I'll give you tables of tables of stone and a law and commandments I've written that you may teach them. 
Moses is the lawgiver. He's called that. In fact, in the Supreme Court building, there's all these famous law lawgivers throughout history, like these famous law his, these law, these famous law his, givers throughout history. But in the center of them is Moses holding the holding two tablets. Okay, and they're all looking towards him. I mean, he, he he's the one who established the law of God and gave it to Israel. It's not really the law of Moses. Technically, it's the law that God gave Moses to give to Israel. So he's the law giver. He establishes the law and the law. King David, we're going to read about him here in 1 Kings 8, verse 25 through 26. Now, therefore, Lord God of Israel, keep with your servant David that you promise him, sinner shall not fail you a man by sight in the throne of Israel, so that my children may take heed to their way, they may walk before me as you've walked before me. And now, O God of Israel, let your word, I pray you be verified, you speak to your servant, and you spoke to my servant David, my, my father. Solomon speaking here. But what do we see about David? David establishes the kingdom of Israel. Saul was king first, but it was unstable. David brings stability to the kingdom. And, and, and this promise of, an, of, of a kingdom, a throne a throne's going to be there, establishing, again, the law that's going to rule this kingdom. David is putting that law into effect here in establishing the kingdom itself. So he's foundational to the kingdom, just as Moses was foundational to the Torah, the law. Now, we continue on here in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 11. And we'll read this. We are following, and this is about Shoal, the Apostle Paul is writing this. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For their foundation can that is laid, which is, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Okay, who's Paul writing to? He's writing to Corinthians. Corinth is 50 at that time it was 50% Jewish, 50% Gentile. But, but it's in a Gentile, it's in it's an Achaia, a Gentile country. It's not in Israel. And he, and he's really the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter went to the Jews, he went to the Gentile, and, and he's and he's the chief apostle to the Gentiles. And the foundation he's building is not himself, but 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 Christ Jesus. The one that's the son of David, as we talked about last week. The one, the one, the one who in the future we've talked about before is going to make the law, who's going to is going to is going to bring the law into Israel, and make it the law of the land, and the parts that apply, the law of the war, the parts that apply to everyone, the law of the world, as he takes as his kingdom expands and takes over the entire world. That's the foundation, not Paul. Messiah is Jesus, Yahshua. So, but, he, but he's laid this foundation down. And others, disciples, people, partners with him and disciples of, of his later, built upon it. Well, that's the same, that's the same thing that Patrick does did in Ireland. He laid the foundation down, had partners, and also had, reigned up disciples to continue the work after after him. So 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 that's our you know, that's perhaps our first parallel here. And there's there's a, there, I found more than a dozen of these, but we're just going to go over the eight most important ones today. Now we're we're going to continue on in First Samuel. We look at the next one here, beginning in First Samuel sixteen, verse twelve through 20, 12 through thirteen. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and wear of all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, anoint him for, he, for this is he. And Saul took the oil of the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst, in the midst of his brother. And the spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So, so all we see here, we see that David is anointed to be king. Saul's king at the time, but David's going to, but the, his line's going to be replaced with the line of David. And when he becomes king, he's been given the job to do, been, been the call, and the, the Spirit of God is upon him so he can carry out the job. But now what, what we see in Isaiah what, what, the same thing with Moses. In Isaiah 63, verse 11 through 14, read the following. 
He remembered of days, the days of old, Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he put his Holy Spirit within him, him being Moses, that led them to the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water, the water before them to make him an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. As a, as a, as a beast goes down the, into the valley, the Spirit of God caused him to rest. So did he lead your people to make himself a glorious name. Okay, notice the connection with the Holy Spirit here again, the Ruach HaKadosh with Moses. Moses, well, we'll, we'll look at this, but, he, but, but when did he get this? He got the Spirit of God before he started delivering the people by the Spirit of God. Kind of makes sense. So, so, in Moses, so Moses is given, this, given the Spirit of God as well to do the job laid before him. Now, we, now we're going to look at the show of the Apostle Paul Lastly, here in Acts 9, verse 17 through 18. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and putting his hands on him, Brother Saul, the Lord, the Lord, even Jesus, has appeared to you as you came. In the way you came, sent me that you may that you, that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And there fell from his eyes been scales, and received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Okay, so what we see here, we see. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Ghost. And we know that that meant he, he, he was baptized beyond just being filled. I'll talk about, I've talked, talked about the differences before, but, you know, in brief, baptism results in speaking in tongues. And Paul himself wrote, I, I, you know, I thank God I speak in tongues more than y'all, more than everyone else, right? Okay. And the whole congregation of Corinth. But they were, but nonetheless, they were they were using it for the wrong reason, and he was using it for the right reason. So the Holy Spirit, and, and I, as I mentioned, Patrick wrote in his own writings that he spoke in tongues. You know, spoke a, a, a heavenly language that he he, he he did not know how to speak on his own, if I remember how he how he worded it. But baptizing the Holy Spirit to do the job at hand, which was, of course, in his case. To be Paul, be an apostle to the Gentiles. Patrick, apostle to the Ir to the Irish, primarily. He spills in little area areas. We'll discuss that, but mostly it's the Irish. Now, now that they're now that they're set up for this, we're gonna they got some things in common. We're gonna start talking about, and we're gonna look and, and we're gonna start here with Moses. Because a very common pattern, again, remember, Patrick's looking back at these three men, at their situation in their life, because when the same things come up in his life, he's going to respond in the same way. In Exodus 2, verse 15 through 19, read the following. When Pharaoh heard this, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and, and filled the troughs of the water to their father's flock. To water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and wired their flock. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it you are come so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Okay, so a king tried to kill Moses and angered a king and fled from the face of the king to another country to escape. And when he arrived in their country, they didn't recognize him for who he was. They, they were looking at his manner and the way he dressed, except, and, and thought he was an Egyptian. And then culturally he was in a lot of ways, but that it was more than just an Egyptian. And it was similar with Patrick. They thought they captured a Rome, a Romano, British Romano, a Roman, because you know his father's in the garrison. He dressed that way, etc. But they, they really captured something much more than what they saw. And notice how Mo, Moses goes on to be a shepherd for this guy, just as Patrick began went on to be a shepherd. And of course, he learned. You know, of course, that's when Patrick learned their language and and their customs and so on and so forth. It's going to help him later. 
So Moses is here learning the ways of the desert, which is going to be very helpful. In fact, in fact, we find out later he's in the area of Sinai. He's going to be very helpful when, when he brings them back. When he brings the people. When he brings the people of Israel back to that same area later. Now, we were on a similar situation here in in 1 Samuel 27, verse 1 through 4. And David said in his heart, I'll now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing bearing me. I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me no to seek me anymore in the coast of Israel, and Saul shall escape out of his hand. And David arose and he passed over the hundred men that were with him in Akesh, and unto Akesh the son of, of Maach, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish in, the, in Gath, and he and his men, every man, every man with his household, even over his two wives, Ahinoab, the, Jez, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul, Saul that David fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. Okay, so again, it's that same pattern. Escaping the wrath of the king, going into the land, even in the enemy territory, to do so. David did this, and, and Patrick did the same thing numerous times. Kings tried to kill him. In fact, he wrote in his journal, he expected every day to be murdered. He had constant opposition. It wasn't just from the kings. We'll talk about some other opposition later. But in the kings in particular, numerous ones tried to kill him. And some, and some, and one of his disciples got, to, um, he actually was going somewhere in a chariot. He knew the king was after Patrick, and he went on the chariot instead. And the king killed his disciple thinking it was Patrick. Okay. So uh, the same pattern here. And again, they, so what they did, Patrick flew like, like, like when he was in, when he was in Del, Del Arati. Where he first became king, where he first, that's the first, when he got his, when he first, when he first the first congregation he established in Del Arati. And when he was there, the king and the Druids violently opposed him. But the king's brother took him, took him and gave him a place to start the first congregation. But eventually he had to flee Del Arati to Del Riata in, in, in part, in Del, in Del Riata, part of it was in, in, in northeast, in, in northeast, most part of, of Ireland, part of it was in the south, it was in the northwest, most part of Scotland. This kingdom spanned those, and he had to go to the Scotland side, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. But he later, but he had to, but he had to go and live in Scotland for a while. And while he did, the false church of Rome tried to try to turn all the all of his converts against him. By the way, they sent a bishop. They sent a bishop in Southern Ireland when he started having success in Northern Ireland. Who established a small congregation, and and when the bishop learned that Patrick had fled, had went to had went had went to uh, had went to Scotland over to Pickland, which is on, on the opposite coast of the opposite coast on the northeast coast, the, the eastern is basically the eastern half of modern Scotland today. You know, to to rescue to rescue some of his of his Irish congregants who've been uh, kidnapped. We got in a slave raid, we try to redeem them or get them back or whatever. And he got over and he found that Corticus, the king, the, the, the king Corticus, who had been, the, had been appointed the Romans and became king of their pick uh, in Pickland, had indeed him and, and most of Pickland had, had left Celtic uh, Christianity and returned to the religion of the Druids. And he wrote that sharp rebuking letter I talked about to him. And that was in 431 AD when he did that. Well, while he was gone doing all that, this bishop, this Roman Catholic bishop, went to Del Riata, Del, Del Riata, to establish a church there and tried to win everyone and turn everyone completely against Patrick. And when he got back there, he, he Patrick had to flee to another place. And eventually he eventually, eventually he eventually he was able to come back. He was he was he was able to come back to Del Riata because uh, 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 th twenty years later, a new king who was a disciple of Patrick's expelled all Catholics from Del Riata, and that was the end of that. But 
He had this constant opposition from kings, the Druids, and the Roman Catholic Church. He had to deal with. So he's fleeing to other countries all the time, even in the enemy territory, which, uh, again, remember, he fled to, he fled to Pickland because they were in enemy territory. They, they, they had uh, enslaved some of his congregants over in Ireland and took them over, the, and took them over to eastern Scotland. Now, we continue on in, in Acts 9, verse 28 through 30, and we read, and we, we read about Shaul, the Apostle Paul, how this applied to him, and very much parallels that of, of, of Patrick. We're going to look at one example here in, in Acts 9, 28 through 30. And he and him, going in, going in and out of Jerusalem, he boldly spoke in the name of Jesus, disputed by the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which are the the brother knew they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Okay, Grecians here is not Greeks; it's Greek-speaking Jews. They're in Jerusalem. Remember, that's the same group that's that, that the same group who had opposed Stephen and ultimately got Stephen stoned, where Paul had been watching the clothes of those doing the stoning. So that's so that same group now has turned on Paul. <laughs> Stephen also disputed with them. So and just they slow slew Stephen. They went to go. They uh, tried to. Sl and notice what they had to do. They had to go down to Tarsus. Where's Tarsus? The capital of Cilicia. People will say in English, but in, in plain Greek, you can read it. It's Calicia, literally the land of the Celts. And I've talked about this for that connection with Paul and the, and the Celts. Remember, he's born in Tarsus, so he has a Roman citizenship. It was a, it was a Celtic kingdom. And then they just basically, then the Romans had to fight to get their kingdom. The king just went out and made an agree, made, negotiated a, a good treaty with them instead. Hey, you don't have to fight and you know lose a bunch of men. We lose people here. We'll come into your subjection, but we want you know everyone in Tarsus to be mathematically a Roman citizen. That was part of the you know, in the capital Roman citizen. That was part of the deal, and so on and so forth. But it's the land of the Celts, literally. And, and, and indeed, the the ancient pictures of Shaul were probably perhaps uh, conjectured. You know, it wasn't actually like he sat down for some of the painted photo. I mean, there are a couple hundred, maybe a year, hundred years after he died. But nonetheless, give us some indication. And he's a lot lighter skin shade than, say, yeah, the ones of Yeshua, the ones of the ones of the other apostles. So it's quite possible a little intermarriage went on there as well. So, you know, this I've mentioned this before again when I talked about when I when I, when I talked about uh, how. Celtic Christianity began. It really begins with Paul and his disciple, and his disciple called Saint Ellen. So you got the same problem. You got the same pattern over and over again. This is just one example. Paul has to go to a foreign land. He's in his homeland, Jerusalem. His city. I mean, he was born in Tarsus, but he grew up in Jerusalem. He went back home, fleeing from another king, Aretas, and he got there near the fleet of a foreign land as well. And so this is why you see with Patrick this pattern of fleeing over and over again, just like you see it in Paul. I could have gave you many examples of Paul as well, fleeing kings, but not every king. He got different reactions from different kings. But we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that eventually. Now, now we're going to look at the call. We're going to start by looking at the call of Moses. And we'll sell this applied to the call of Patrick as well. These things, these, 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 all three of these men had a call. They had a call at one point for deliverance of someone, and, and they responded. And so we begin here in Moses in Exodus three, verse seven through ten. The Lord said, "I have surely seen the affliction of the people which are in Egypt, and I heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, to bring them out of the land into a good land, into a, into a large, into a land flowing with milk and honey." The place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you send you unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay, the people of Israel are in Egyptian bondage. They're, they're, they've been enslaved. And 
The call is for Moses. For God is for Moses to go go there as God's tool. The tool, the tool that God's going to use to free them from the slavery. And Moses' response was, he, you know, he packed up and went and got right to it. Now we see, now we're going to 1 Samuel 17, verse 23 through 6, 26, and we see another call to action for King David as well. As he talked to them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistine, and spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The men said, the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that's come up? Surely to defy Israel has come up and it shall be. And it shall be that the man who kills and the king will the rich with great riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke to the men, standing by him, said, Watch me done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel. Who for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He should, he should defy the armies of the living God. Okay, David had already been anointed. Now, people get on about the men of Israel being afraid of this man. But the fact is, if anyone but David fought Goliath, Goliath would have won. David alone had been anointed with the Holy Spirit. David alone had what it took to kill Goliath. It wasn't because of his, sure, 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 he'd practice, but it wasn't just because he was expert sling slingsman and a war, and all this stuff. It was because the spirit of God was on him, and that. It, so now that spirit of God is calling him to respond to that call to action when he hears it, and he, again, it responds immediately. We see, and prevails. I might add as well. Now let's look at Acts chapter sixteen, verses nine through thirteen. And see the same thing in the life of the Apostle Paul, Shaul. A vision appeared to, appeared to Paul that night, and there stood, there stood a man of Macedonia praying, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After seeing the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathered that the Lord had called it for us to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came straight came with a straight course to Samothakia, and the next day to Neapolis. And from, there to, and from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and the colony, and we're in that city abiding certain days. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city by, to, went out of the city by a riverside where prayers was to be made, and we sat down and spoke unto the women that resorted there. Okay, so Paul gets this call, the Macedonian call, we will call it. And what's he see? He sees a vision of a man saying, come help us. Help him with what? With the gospel. Now see, Moses had, had saved him from physical slavery. David saved him from physical, from physical death or impossible slavery. If they had kept their agreement, the, if they had sent a champion out in, in the Goliath one, it had been the slaves of the Philistines. Okay. But this is even bigger than life and death. This is being saved from eternal, from, from, from spiritual slavery, the slavery of sin that, 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 that ruins lives in this world. And it brings eternal death in the world to come. And what and what did Paul do when he what what did he do when he had that vision? He immediately acted on it. Him and those with him, he understood it was to preach the gospel. And notice he goes straight. He goes there and, and the first Sabbath, he starts the Jews first. These women are Jews that when you don't have enough men to make a synagogue, you don't have a minion. You have ten men, ten ten men who are, in modern terms, bar mitzvah, who become who who, 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 who become sons of the commandments then the the, the, the the thing was to meet by the river because there were certain there were certain rituals that were running water were needed and met by the river on the sabbath instead but, there, but that tells us these are jewish women his first convert indeed in all of europe is a jewish woman from thyatira anyways so so paul is now so saul answered well, St. Patrick had a similar one, a similar call. He had a dream, a man of Ireland, and so Macedonia called him and said, come help us. He understood he meant bring, bring him the gospel. And according to his own writings, he immediately went there. Now, in the, in the made-up history, 
of Jocelyn, of Provis and Jocelyn, he went to Toulouse, France, learned how, learned all the ways of, of the Roman Catholic Church, became a bishop, and then went to Ireland, you know, about 10 years later. Totally contradicting, again, St. Patrick's own writings that have survived. But not, no, he went there immediately, answered the call immediately, using the wisdom he learned from the examples of Moses, David, and Paul, or Shaul, as his name really is, his Hebrew name. So, St. Patrick did this. And, by, and also, Provis and Jocelyn were not aware of, 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 of Roman Catholic history either. Toulouse, the king of the Franks, didn't become, didn't come into the Catholic persuasion till about 800 AD, 300 years after Patrick's died, and the university wasn't built till after that. That's Patrick supposedly went to. Again, a total fabrication and lie with no historically impossible and no foundation. Just a story made up to convince, to dupe Irish people into believing Catholicism is what Patrick brought to Ireland. But not, 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 and it worked, except in North Ireland, where they never bought it. <laughs> they, they were never taken in by this deception. But it worked in a lot of Ireland, for sure. So, that's, so we got that similar call there. Now we're going to continue on here and look at another similarity here between between these between between these three men and Saint Patrick. And we begin here in Exodus five verses one through two, where we see what answering the call involves doing. And after Moses and Aaron went in, told Pharaoh and said to the Lord God, and said, "Thus says the Lord God of Israel." Let my people go. They may hold me a feast in the wilderness, a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? To let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Okay, so by Pharaoh's own, Israel, Pharaoh's own words, I know not the Lord. He's an idol worshiper. He, you know, he, he's an idol worshiper. We'll talk about that more later. He's opposed to, his response is opposition. Is opposition. But they, but they, but they were sent to kings to witness to, to witness to the king of Egypt. Pharaoh's is the title of the king of Egypt. And they went to witness to him. And to tell him what God commanded. They were not responsible for his fault, his response. In fact, God already told him he was going to be, he was going to harden his heart, except. God knew how he was going to respond, but he, they were sent, Moses, Moses was sent to a king, confronted kings with, with, with God, with, with what God said. Now we continue on in 2 Samuel 8, verses 5 through 10, and we'll read the following. And when the Assyrians of Damascus came to Sukkur, about King David here, when Sukkur, Adaezer, king of Zobah, Zobah. David slew the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants and brought, and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David wherever Syria went. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of King Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Bata and from Merathai, the, the cities of Hadadezer, King David took much exceeding brass. When Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten the host of Hadaezer, then Toy sent Joram his son unto King David to salute him and to bless him. Because he had fought against Hadaezer and smitten him, for Hadaezer had wars with Toy. And Joram brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass. Okay, so what we see here, we see two kings with two different reactions. One opposes David. David's out doing what? He's trying. He, he, he's expanding, fighting the enemies of God, taking the taking the taking control of the promised land. And remember, and remember, it, it goes it goes up north. The line goes up a little goes up a little bit north of Damascus. If you ever if you ever mapped out the places the Bible tells us, okay, we're so he's going he's going up there into Syria, 
I mean, he didn't go to the fight the series. He went to Zoba. But now the series have came down, and he's taken, and he's put them under tribute. Their king's under tribute. Adazar is dead. He killed him. And, 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 and they also they also are involuntarily giving him wealth, okay? Wealth he's going to use later. We'll talk about that. However, Toy has an entirely different reaction. Toy doesn't go to war, David. Toy submits to him and sends tribute voluntarily to David for the purposes of God. And Toy prospers. Where how does how the Ezar perished? And so, you know, we see this the same thing here. We see the same thing here with Patrick as well. Pat Patrick Patrick when he Patrick when he first when he first goes to Ireland, he goes to a place called not not Del Riada, just south there, Del Arati. And Del Arati. The king and the Druids there violently oppose Patrick. Well, his brother, his brother receives him and lets him, and, and Patrick prophesies his brother's line and his line are going to become king of Dalriati. And shortly after that comes to pass. You know, and th this is about 400 AD. And this is what really starts giving Patrick, you know, grabbing the attention of, of the Druids, of the people not the Druids, the people of Northern Ireland that, you know, he, he went and confronted the king and the king lost. <laughs> just like Pharaoh lost. Just like this king lost. But this other king responded completely different. And that king got promoted. Okay. That king was blessed by God, which they also noticed. Patrick said this thing, but then it came to pass. So, you see that same pattern here with, with David. And lastly, we see in, the, in, the, in the, we see it in the life of the Apostle Paul. These, ah, oh boy, this, we we see we see this in we see this in uh, Acts nine, fifteen. 15 verses, verse 16. And this is what it says, but the Lord said to him, go your way for as a chosen vessel to me to, to bear, to bear my, to bear witness, uh, to bear my name for the Gentiles and Kings and the children of Israel. For I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my own, for my name's sake. Okay. So, so what do we see here? Why do we see here? Why do we see here about 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 Shaul? He's got to bear the name of Messiah before the Gentiles, people of another of another country, the children of Israel, his own country, and kings. And Paul, you know, this exactly happens to Shaul, the apostle Paul recorded in Acts and in, in other places, like Aretas opposed him in Damascus. He had to flee from him. And the kings have different responses. We mentioned Aretas drove, you know, Aretas, we learned we, we learned Second Corinthians sent it wasn't just the Jewish leaders, but Aretas was backing them up, king of Arabia. And Paul the flee for his life from that king was opposed. And Aretas, by the way, eventually gets, you know, eventually loses his kingdom. Um so you, you know, you know, that that's one hand, right? But on the other hand. On the other hand, we have a different reaction from some other kings. Uh, the governors were basically kings ruling under the uh, maybe the authority, and sometimes they had the title of king, sometimes something else. But they were, they basically had, they basically could do what to do. Most of the gov, the, 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 they they could keep their job as governors, although they kept the peace and collected taxes. And other than that, the the, the senate and stuff wasn't wasn't super picky about how they went about it, to be quite honest. So,
Ananias, yeah. So Ananias is the one who's speaking here. So this same third thing happened with Patrick as well. He he, he did go again to the British Romanos and, and and talk to them some, but mostly to the Irish and their kings and constantly in different reactions. We're gonna look at that, discuss those as we go along here as well. Now in Exodus eight, we, we we're gonna read about how. Some of the details of these confrontations that came through, they're backed up by religious, by people of super, there's a supernatural element to the people they're fighting against who are backing up the kings. And here's what we see, and here's what we see in Exodus 8, verses 18 through 19. The magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. For, for, so there was lice upon the man and beast. And the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Well, as I had mentioned, the Lord had said, knew how Pharaoh was going to react, and he told Moses. But notice who he's fighting. Magicians. They're tied to the Egyptians. But ultimately, they're tied to Satan. There's sort of a, you know, the, the Egyptians, just like the Romans and, and, and the Celts and stuff, you know, had, had a, in their pantheon, had a God that was really connected with death and everything. And you know Satan, and, and this is these magicians. Okay, they're you know these are these are these are kind of direct, direct, directly connected to Satan, and they're opposing Moses. And Moses, and and they admit Moses won here. The God, the God, the God of Israel, the the God of Israel was stronger than Hashatan, Satan. Well, we read here in Second Samuel. 21 18 verses in verse 18 through 22 about how david and his disciple or his men that he, that he trained had to fight a similar fight and they came to pass that there was a battle with the philistines at gob and when sabachai the, the hushathite slew sap which is the son of the giants and there was a battle at gob with and again there was a battle at gob with, in, with the philistines where elanon the son of of Jer Jerio Regum, a Bethlehemite, slew the rare Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a bound gap where a man where a man a great statue, statue that had six on every hand six fingers and every foot six toes, twice more number, and he was also born to the giant. We defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimei. The brother of David slew him. These were the first, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And we showed before how uh, uh, we showed before we, we, we talked about before the patriarchs, you know, the days of Noah and afterwards were told. And we showed extensively how these giants were at a supernatural connection to Satan, how uh, they were descendants of, of, of fallen angels who had intermarried or at least bred. With human women and their descendants. Let me notice you say one of them, it says, the son of the giant. I mean, it was born to the giant. Okay. So, so, so th there's that, again, there's that element of these rep of these direct connect, direct, strongly connected individuals with Satan fighting against, against the individual, the man that God's that they, it's strongly connected with God. And his disciples, and again, the people, the sa sa team Satan loses. Okay, now we see this in Acts. Again, an example of this here in Acts thirteen, verse six through eleven. And by the way, those were hired by the king of the king of Gath. You keep seeing Gath, the king of the Philistines. So there's that connection to the kings as well. Now here's what we see in Acts six thirteen, verse six through eleven. They had gone to the Isle of Papos. They found a certain sorcerer, a, pro, a, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was the son, which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who was called, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But, but Elymas, the sorcerer, pursuing his name, was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and, and said, O full of all sub, 
subtility and all mischief. You child of the devil, you're enemy of you enemy of all righteous. Will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately fell on them a mist in the darkness. He went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Okay, so they're on Papos, the, the Isle of Cyprus, and they went all the way from the eastern end to the western end. And this Sergius Paul, so the first named disciple, the, the first part, disciple that Paul creates that gets the, that's named for us. He's a deputy, relates to the governor, and he's, he's, he's acting as king over that area and really over, over all of Cyprus. Okay, so and, and what's connected with him is this sorcerer well a sorcerer isn't isn't just an idle priest it's someone who's directly connected with satan and paul brings us out child of the devil now some will, will look at someone and say oh they're a jew we must listen to him this jew is a false prophet don't be taken in by someone they may they may say they're jewish that may be totally true so are the pharisees and the sadducees and the scribes who plot against messiah and kill him and this guy here has supernatural power, but it's not from God. I mean, his name is Bar Jesus, Aramaic, meaning son of, Je son, of, son of Jesus, son of salvation. Yahshua, Hebrew, means salvation. So, so he even, even, even makes himself sort of a false connection to Jesus with his, with his name, okay? You know, claiming to be a disciple of Messiah, but he's not, perhaps. It's in the game of the son, you know, but son of. So there's this, but he's an enemy of all righteousness. And notice how he perverts the right ways of the Lord. We talked about a Purim, how Halloween is a total twisting, trick-or-treating is a total twisting and perversion of the right ways of the Lord. How Purim, the commandments to give to the poor, it's often in, in keeping in keeping up in line with later the the, the Bible said before Jesus uh, made it even clear to give you know to give anonymously so you wear a mask etc you know so you're dressing up hiding your identity to give not to take and you know trick or treats extortion in America it's beginning in California and if someone didn't give a treat uh, the trick would be like fork their yard or toilet paper their toilet paper their house or whatever the case was it was basically really extortion and this was what a perversion of the right ways of the lord hiding your identity to give so that they're not so they're not thanking you they're not looking to you as their source they're, they're thanking god looking to him as their source well it's the same sort of things going on with this guy he's he's jewish he's made that connection with jesus but he's perverting the right way of the lord but he's really what a child of the devil He's connected to Satan, and there's this contest between them. And what happens? Shaul, the apostle Paul, wins decisively. This man, this man is this man is made blind, and then later he's going to see. He says, "You'll not see for a season the sun for a season," but he's totally defeated, and perhaps, he, and perhaps he came to faith later. Remember, the blinders fell off the eyes of Paul. Not just um, figuratively, literally, but also figuratively. He himself had been blind and now could see. Literally, and after the road to Damascus, and figuratively. And perhaps the same thing was going to happen here. But the site, the fact, and some of the Druids indeed were defeated by St. Patrick in like manner. They were in league with the devil. They had four houses, one of them was connected, especially with the horned god, their equivalent of the devil. It's getting connected with Halloween. Holloman, the, the horned God. I mean, and, and you know, the stuff of nightmares. This, you know, every horror movie you've ever seen with these guys wearing cloaks and you can't see their face and their hands, except maybe they come with a knife and they, you know, and they kill someone or, or, or torture them or whatever. It's all from the Druids and particularly connected to that, to, to, ho to the beginning of Holloman season, winter, the four outs of the Druids, one for each season. A sacrifice to him. So, 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 
And so St. Patrick defeats the four houses of the Druids. He has a confrontation with each one of them that rule over uh, that, that they're again, the Kings are terrified of the Druids. They got great respect for him and their fear. And they're actually really afraid of him. And Solomon, in, 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 I'm sorry, Patrick breaks their power by demonstrating the power of God is greater. He didn't just go there in word, but in deed. But what he didn't do, he did things in line with what the word of God says, his, his miracles that actually got recorded by his enemies in him, healing people, causing the blind to see, things in line with, with, with Acts 16, uh, Mark 16, the promise of Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, and things in, perhaps in line with Acts as well. He didn't call, cause rocks to come out of the ocean or any of this kind of nonsense. That was totally made up again. Fabrications to somehow make him look like even more, you know, more powerful than he really was. But he really did have power over the Druids, who were also children of the devil, particularly the House of the Winter. Now, Before I move on, one more point about the House of the Winter. Why October 31st? Because the Druids began their day at sunset. The, first, the And their seasons were determined by the amount of sunlight there was. A solaric season, as opposed to a, a, a climactic season, which the Romans used, where winter began, where winter began the first day of December. Or, or an astronomical season like the Bible uses where winter begins with the winter solstice. There's, it, it, so November is when the, when, when the, when the days get, are, at the, are, are getting, get, that, get really short. And, the first, and it begins at, after sunset on October 31st. And this is why they, and, this, and, and again, you know, the, the, their, their concern is the world's getting dark. I mean, the, 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 they got people scared. The world's getting darker. Crops aren't growing except we got to appease. We got to appease the horned God. This way you see pictures of Satan with horns, by the way, it comes from the, we got to appease the horned God. It's going to require human sacrifices and this kind of thing. And that's why all this nightmarish stuff you see on Halloween came from. But that's why October 31st. Now, so they both, so, so he, he, he so he, he was confident. Patrick was confident. He could confront, these these direct servants of Satan and overcome them because Moses, because of Moses, David, and Paul had done had already done so. Now we continue on in Deut and we're gonna read about another aspect here. Uh, uh, another aspect here of Patrick here, of these men and Patrick as well. And in Deuteronomy 12, verses one through five, read the following. Now, these are the statutes which you shall observe during the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it all the days you may live on the earth. That you shall utterly destroy all the place where these nations possess their, you shall possess, which you shall possess, serve their gods upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and upon every, and under every green tree. You shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn down their, and burn their groves with fires. And you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of, out of that place. You shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but in the place which your God shall choose of all your tribes put his name there, even unto his habitation you shall seek, and you shall come. Okay, there's two things here. One is destroy the places where the, where, where the idol wor worshippers are worshipping. They're idols. Don't leave their idols intact. Destroy them completely. They're, they're graven images. Whatever it is, where it's an image, a statue, whatever it is, destroy it completely, but destroy the place of their worship as well. And then build a place to worship God instead. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, Boave, Yahoo, however you like to pronounce, you know, the you know, the tetragamon, or not pronounce, just call it Yahweh Boave. That's who we're talking about here. Now that's what Mo that's what Moses gave. That was the commission to the children of Israel through Moses, and it's what Patrick did. And notice particularly under the high, the high hills, the, the the high mountains, the hills, and the and the green trees. Remember, I talked about how the uh, how the Romans never drove the drove the Druids out of the Scottish Highlands. They never took possession of them. The Romans didn't. 
they ringed them, but then then the war, but then, but then they got then 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 they had to go deal with other struggles, and they and they, and they were never able to they were never able to, uh, able to close the close the ring in on them and get rid of the druids completely. But why there? Because that's where they that's where they met. They would meet in caves. They'd meet under ever look every green tree, well particularly evergreens like say a Christmas tree. Okay. And what would they do? They, you know, that's what they, that's what they sacrifice people and things like that. But they also, I mentioned most of the time, you, you just see them kind of worshiping rocks and trees, but they, but in Ireland, the four houses each had a temple and each one had an idol in it. St. Patrick, after defeating each house in through some sort of, some sort of supernatural contest, Destroyed the ha- the the temple the, the the house that the the physical building the house of the, the the house of the druids met and destroyed their idol as well, and he built a congreg and he built buildings to worship God in their place for all these congregations he started. He followed the instructions here given in Deuteronomy, and we see that David, uh, David followed these same. Uh, carried out these things that Moses had told him to. Moses gave the instructions, but now David is going to finish carrying this out at least to a great degree. And we see this in 1 Kings verses 8, 17 through, 6, 17 through 21. And it was the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the, for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said to David, my father, where is in your heart to build a house into my name? You did well that was in your heart. Nonetheless, you shall not build a house, but your son shall, that shall come out of your loins, he shall build a house into my name. And David has performed, and the Lord has performed his word as he spoke, and I am risen in the room of David my father, and so on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and I built a house in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And I've set there a place for the ark, wherein is the covenant of God, the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, that covenant we just talked about with Moses is there in the ark, which, again, I, I, I brought this before. That It's an old English word for box, okay? This, you know, elaborate box covered in gold, in, in and out, and so on. And okay, where it contains that covenant. And that covenant said to destroy the idols, which David largely did. As he, as, 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 you know, everywhere, everywhere he took over, the idols were gone. And he's pl- and he, and he wanted to build a place for them to worship as the as as God said because he said he'd rebuild and he'd rebuild Jerusalem was that place and David wanted to go ahead and build it. Now God didn't allow him because he was a man of he, he, he was a man with blood on his hands, not just from war but also from like Uriah the Hittite killing him, killing an innocent man to get his wife. And. But Solomon was a man of peace. In fact, his name means peace. Shalomo. It's connected to the, the word sh- shalom, peace. Okay. Shalom. Shalom, shalomo, all comes from the same root. So he so he's so he's so he's the one that's gonna build it. And of course, it's a picture of Messiah is gonna build the kingdom in peace, you know, after after the war is over at, at a after the after Armageddon and it's all over. Now he starts building. His, he goes over. He builds his kingdom by seeing people speaking to people peacefully t- first, and if they will submit to him, great. And if not, then then destroy them, leave them the ruinous heap, and move on. But again, a, he's going to have king, peace, bring peace throughout the earth eventually, whether people want it or not. And so that's why. So that's no reason Solomon. But David had in his heart. David wants to fulfill those instructions. And why do we see with Shaul, the apostle Paul here in Acts 26, verses 15 through 20. And I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And But rise, stand up on your feet. I prepared you for this purpose and make you a minister and a witness, both of these things which you've seen the things, and of those things in which I will appear unto you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. They receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly to the heavenly vision, but showed first to them in Damascus and Jerusalem throughout the coast of Judea, then to the Gentiles who repent and turn to God, 
and do works meet for repentance. Okay, now this is the people. Notice it's opposed to the Gentile, means the Jewish people. He's he, we already read where the Jewish people tried to kill him. He had to be delivered. He's going to be delivered. He's going to deliver. Bo- he's going to be delivered from both until un- until his work is done. He's going to have a lot. Of tr- he's already been told he's going to have a lot of trouble. But for what purpose? Delivered from the power of Satan. And what and what happened? And what happens? Paul himself didn't destroy any temples. It's true, but but he laid the foundation. And when and when enough people turned to God and away from this, in fact, some of these temples just became totally empty. Nobody was showing up to them. You know, the, just people just abandoned them and eventually destroyed many of them. Not all of them. The Acropolis is still up. You know, the Parthenon is still up there on the Acropolis in Greece. But the majority of them, the people who formerly worshipped them, destroyed them themselves, and they had built themselves places of worship to worship Yahweh Bwave through Messiah Yeshua, as God had instructed, and it was the same again with Saint Patrick. Some place uh, his, his him and his disciples, destroy, you know, once people turned from the religion of the Druids, they, you know, the, the, there was no problem destroying the temple and building place of worship for the God of Israel instead. Now we wrap up here with, with, with all with, with these with these with, with them when they're done here in our final section here. We've talked about their great work and how Patrick again had them to look back at and, and put that and put their example into action. But now we're now well, what? But, but everyone's life on this earth ends till Messiah. Well, till till the rapture occurs. Well, till the Messiah is on this earth. Your life on this earth is going to end one way or another. If you're raptured, you're going to be leaving the surf. So let's read about this. They're, they're, well, what, about what happened after they finished their job? In Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 through 7, read the following. So Moses, the servant of God, died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the land of Moab, over against Beth Beor. But no man knows of a sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim nor is natural force abate it. Okay, so, 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 so Moses here, why is God burying bury Moses himself and not let anyone know where he's buried? Well, remember the Egyptians made mummies and they would continue to worship, they would worship the remains of their, of their great kings who were also sometimes Depending on, the, depending on the dynasty, in some cases, the, the Pharaoh himself was considered a god like, 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 like the one Moses confronted and said, let my people go. Well, God didn't want them worshiping the, worshiping the bones of Moses, his remains. So he didn't want them knowing, so he didn't let them know where they were, basically. And, you know, what happened with Moses, and to this day, I mean, you see it in the, the Gospels. They say we're disciples of Moses, not followers of God, disciples of Moses. And they're not even really disciples of Moses at all. But along, among a lot of Orthodox, I mean, they uphold Moses to a position that really only Messiah should be, 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 be held up to. And it's not, it's not Moses' doing. The same thing happened to Paul, show the Apostle Paul in Corinthians. That's why he wrote Corinthians, part of why he wrote it. Some of them were, were holding, uh, were holding. Some of them said they were followers of Yeshua. Some were followers of Paul. Some followers of Apollos. Some followers of Peter. Peter, Paul, and Apollos were not trying to draw the disciples away from themselves, and Paul directs them back to Yeshua. And so, you know, the, the same sort of thing would happen with Moses. So the Lord didn't want them digging up his relics and, and, and you know, and worshiping them. And the bones are unclean anyway, according to law, anyways. Now, St. Patrick, also, when he died, God didn't bury him, but, but according to the writings, the writings of his disciples, a couple of them buried him, buried him in a, in a hidden place, and took the secret of where he was buried to their grave. No one knows to this day where St. Patrick was buried. However, if you visit Ireland, there's about half a dozen places 
towns, whatever, they'll say they have the grave of St. Patrick. And several competing churches of the, of the Catholic Church who also claim they, they built their church the side of the barrel of St. Patrick. And one, I believe, even has a, uh, one or two of them even have a, a supposed tomb of St. Patrick in the, center of the, in the center of the building or whatever, you know. So, but St. Patrick did, was actually buried when no one knew him, where he was, for the same reason as Moses. And also, like Moses, he died at 120 years of age. Now, that's a long while to live. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he kept, he, and also, you know, the indication of, uh, of not himself, but of his enemies and his disciples is he pretty much kept going at it till, if not till day died or close to the time of his death. You know, it, it, his strength, like Moses, his eyes didn't become, he didn't become, he didn't become weak where he couldn't do the job until, Again, in his case, perhaps enough not de- the day of his death, but very close to the day of his death. Now, we continue on in Acts 13, verse, in, in verse 36, we see another aspect about the end of David that also applies to Patrick. For David, after he'd served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was laid to his fathers, and saw corruption. Okay, David did what? He served his own generation by the will of God. And then it was time for someone else. It was time for Solomon in his case. Well, the same with Patrick. Patrick's disciples are ready for the job. And Ireland, by the time he's dead, has mostly been won. But the Roman Empire has completely fell apart. Darkness is covering Europe. And the, and, and the Scottish went back to the religion of the Druids, by and large. And even, and even down, and down in Britain and England has been invaded by, and been invaded by the, uh, well, the, the Anglo-Saxons, who English comes from, you know. And the world's kind of a mess, but it's not. It's also, the, it's also the calling of St. Patrick to fix that mess. He has served his own generation. His job is done. And now it's time for him to die and, and be buried as King David was. And lastly, we end with this from the Apostle Paul, about the Apostle Paul, the words of the Apostle Paul about a similar thing with him that applies to Patrick as well. In 2 Timothy Four verses six through seven read the following. Now I'm ready to be offered in the time of departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In a fight it was. Again, there's many more parallels I could have showed, but one of them was that all of these men, Shaul, Moses, David, Shaul, and then Patrick had trouble all kinds of trouble, opposition in carrying out the will of God after they, after they responded to the call. Even though they were equipped with the Holy Spirit, there was much opposition. And we talked about some of that today. Much opposition. I mean, Catholic, in Patrick's case, the opposition from, 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 from many of the kings. And some, like Paul, we talked about earlier with Paul, how, the, how that king, went, went, how that king sum, sum, went with Paul later, that, that, that ruler. Sergius Paulus, by the way, Paul's name in Latin and Greek is Paulus, and perhaps picked up this because you don't see him use that until until he leaves Cyprus and goes to the mainland of Europe and goes to the mainland of Turkey. I should say what today is Turkey, but goes to the mainland to begin his, you know, on his third mission. It's the first time you see him that were and, and say his name's replaced. It says Paul, who was also called Saul, 13 years after the road to Damascus. And perhaps he's just using the name of his first named convert as his name. Perhaps, or perhaps he just already, or perhaps he just already had in the habit. That's a Roman name. And he fought this. So that guy came on his side, but there's that back and forth, that struggle, that fight with Paul against the, against false teachers 
like the false church of Rome. Today, people might call them the Catholic Church and the, and, and the Greek Orthodox Church. Like, like the, the, the idol worshipers are already in the area. Like the false teacher, the false apostles, like even Bar Jesus, you know, a false prophet. And kings as well. And Paul had followed these, and his fight was done. He had fought a good fight. He never backed off. He kept that until he finished his course. He kept the faith. He never backed off from his faith. In fact, he says he's about to be offered. Why? He knows he's appealed to Caesar. He's a Roman. he done this once before in Acts. He went for Nero was Caesar. But, but being a Christian wasn't against the law of, of Rome, the region of Rome, but being a, a Christian in Rome was against the law when he went the second time. And, you know, there's, first of all, he, he already witnessed the Caesar, we're told, in one place. He had witnessed the Caesar about Messiah. So Nero may recognize him and realize that. But second, his only recourse would be to not keep the faith, to deny Messiah, to escape death. And he ain't gonna do, he's not going to do it. So he knows he's going to be offered. He's, he, he, he's, going to, he's going to become a martyr as he had martyred others. Now he also is going to be martyred. And it's not far off. But he never, he never swayed from the faith once, he, once his eyes were opened on the road to Damascus. His vision was fixed on the task that was given him and he completed it. And St. Patrick did the same thing. And I would close with the I would close with this thought for you that Saint Patrick demonstrated that God did not stop doing these things with the last apostle, as I was told when I grew up in the Methodist Church. That God still backs up His word as He uh, uh, that the, the words of Yeshua are still true today. He promised two things: if we'll teach, if we'll if we'll preach what He preached and taught and teach what He taught. He promised power and persecution. And St. Patrick, you know, that's the reason. It was the power and the persecution that caused him to be the apostle of Ireland that had so much success and created all those congregations. And, there, and, and But it came because he taught what Messiah, he, he, taught, he, he preached what Messiah said to preach and taught what he taught. And if you're in a congregation that's not experiencing Power, it's probably not experiencing persecution either. There's no power because you're not because they're not teaching, they're not preaching what Messiah preached, and they're not teaching what Messiah taught. These things have not been done away with. That is just a that's just a, an excuse for those for those again that are not obeying the instructions of Messiah. Of course, they're not getting the results he promised if you obey him. But must but it's it's time for all it's time for it's time for you for all of us to take up arms as it were to fight the good fight we've all been called to do something to finish that course and to keep the faith not to quit never deny our eyes fixed like a dove on what's in front of us that's all i have for this week until next week shalom <laughs>